if everybody could go ahead and take your seat, we will get going right on time. We've got a lot to cover tonight, so want want to want to start on time. Well, it got really quiet, so I'm going to start. Um, so welcome, and thank you so much um, for being here tonight. Um, we really appreciate you being here. At, um, it says a lot about our community, and we just appreciate your dedication to our community. So thank you. And a very special thanks to Christy and Tiffany um, with REMAX Alliance for their community support of tonight's town hall meeting. Um, I'd also like to thank My Mountain Town for video, videotaping tonight's meeting and Conifer Jazzercise for providing water. So um, if you get a little dry, there is some water back in the back. Um, our speakers tonight have been asked to present just the facts um, and not in support or in opposition to any development candidate, um, ballot issue, or anything else. Um, and most of you have been here many, many times. But if there's anyone new to our town hall meetings, there will be no campaigning, um, no questions or comments during the presentations. But at 8 o'clock, you will have a chance to talk to all of the presenters and also the candidates. Um, so we hope that you'll stay till 8 and then beyond so you can talk to everybody. So, what issues are most important to you about where we live? According to Conifer Area Council survey, surveys, wildfire risk is number one. At these town hall meetings, you've heard from fire chiefs, you've heard from wildfire mitigation specialists and other agency specialists, but you and I are the key. Where the, number, where the rubber meets the road, Al Leo is here tonight to talk about the Community Ambassador Program and how the ambassadors and you can make a difference. Al. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Early. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. I uh, really appreciate you all uh, coming here this evening. Uh, the Conifer Area Council has really put together a great agenda. The other thing I'd like to do is point out we have some additional excuse me we have some additional community ambassadors out there in the audience uh, the folks that are wearing the stylish red shirts like i have um you know raise your hands we are here really to do a couple things this evening one is to connect with residents um, help you identify who your community ambassador is so that that community ambassador can work with you as we're going to kind of talk about this evening um, why am i here talking about the Community Ambassador Program, it's because we live in an area that is designated in the top 1% of wildfire risk. Wildfire risk, not only in, the, in, in Colorado, but in the country. So as Shirley said, this is on the minds of people, and this is why I'm here to talk about the Community Ambassador Program, as it's a program that can kind of help residents. Uh, so what does a community ambassador do? I've kind of said why I'm here, here because we're in, at a high degree of wildfire risk. So what our role in the community is, is to really work with residents to help you reduce your wildfire risk. You know, our role is to provide information about how to do defensible space, uh, home hardening, uh, things like that in your community, around your home, so that collectively we can reduce the wildfire fire risk in our area. The uh, Elk Creek and Inner Canyon Fire Protection Districts sponsor this program. We are not in, with the fire department. We're not first responders. Um, our role really is, is to provide information and training to help residents uh, reduce their wildfire risk. Um, some of us organize community mitigation projects. You know, I know a couple of the folks that are here uh, have community work days where they identify uh, a property or perhaps roadside mitigation or home hardening as something that, you know, needs to be done in an area of the neighborhood. Uh, so that's an example of some of the things that we can do beyond providing information to you. 
Um, the other thing is to work building that network of residents. We can't do that, our, we can't do all this stuff ourselves. As people work together, band together, and spread the word on what you're doing in your neighborhood and to reduce your wildfire risk, that helps everybody. So that's really, you know, kind of what we are here to do in the community. Uh, we do events like this. We've got a table in the back, as I mentioned, where we can help connect you with your ambassador, provide you with some information. So how do you, how can you become wildfire prepared, aware and prepared? You know, that's kind of my little slogan that I've come up for my planning unit. And it's really, there are some steps you can take right away that can be beneficial. The first one is sign up for lookout alert. You know, you need to be aware of what's going on in your community and uh, create your evacuation plan. Um, you folks can read through that, but it's really, it's evacuation plan. Uh, get a reflective metal address sign. Uh, look at the home ignition zone brochure and um, get a wildfire prepared home assessment. This is where an expert from the fire protection district will come out and look at your property and give you specific guidance and recommendations. Do I have time for a minute and a half video or am I out? Well, you really only have 30 seconds. You can do it 30 seconds now. Okay, so maybe if you can start that in. It really, what I'm trying to do with this video, and we'll see how much of it actually comes through in my 30 seconds, is this is a video of how defensible space actually helps. This approaching this house at the strike team has been assigned to protect, and they are in position and ready to go to keep this house from catching on fire. You see that the fighters trying to creep up into the trees, but for the most part, this part of the fire was actually a creeping grass fire. Really, really do need it. And we're just protecting the deck here and making sure that this fire doesn't get into the mulch. Now, you see that the fire is trying to travel up the trees, but the homeowner did a good job of Point number one. Those trees back up to about 10 feet so the branches don't catch on fire, the low hanging branches. Managing the trees like this will keep the fire from spreading into the crown of the trees, which is very bad. And now the fire is starting to burn up through the mulch, and then lots of smoke starting to get doing a little bit of hot action. Now we're using the water resources to make sure that the fire is dead out as it butts up against the mulch because the mulch so is this is the key mulch. second and point that's not a good thing to have right next to your house because the fire will wick right into uh, the house and, and burn the house down so in five so, minutes you've just seen what it took approximately two and a half hours to do and that's structure protection at the black forest fire Thank you very much for your time. The two key points, limbing up your trees helps. That was a specific point the Colorado Springs Fire Department made. And then don't have combustible materials right up to your home. Thank you very much. Thank you, Al. So another very, very extreme um, issue up here in the, in the Conifer Mountains is water resources. And um, we, in fact, Conifer Area Council put together um, a study action team to study that and um, a few years ago. And John Wallach is here to give you an update on how they're doing. John. Can everyone hear me? It's, uh, good evening. Uh, I'm here to give you the status on the study action uh, team. The last two years, we've shifted our focus to looking at TDS. And so tonight I'd like to give you an overall uh, picture of where the water resources are and also show you, uh, t try to explain why we care about the TDS. There it is. So the conifer activity area is the solid blue line. It's about 1,400 acres, and it gives us a definition, a uh, point to where we can start counting wells and looking at density. Uh, we have 377 wells within the activity center, last count. And uh, 
there are about 360 of those have their own uh, individual septic systems. They're all uh, re refreshing or re uh, recharging our aquifer. And then we also have four centralized systems. Off to the right, you see CHS, that's the Jeffco schools. And they're actually uh, using North Turkey Creek's surface water. But the three uh, centralized systems along 285 are uh, down at the Staples area, the CWA, CSA. That's Conifer Water Association, Conifer Sanitation Association, Staples. And then up at uh, the CMD is Conifer Metro District at the uh, Safeway store. Aspen Park Metro District is located up at uh, King Supers. Okay, uh, you can see uh, the total volume of uh, water uh, that these three centralized systems are using has dropped off in the pandemic years. We're running about 32,000 gallons per day. Half of that is Aspen Park Metro District. About a third of it, or 10,000 gallons per day, is CMD. In the last two years, the recharge up in our area has really improved. So this has to do with the water quantity. We are, if we have good recharge, we're gonna keep that static water level at a point where it's not dropping off. Uh, we have, the blue line is uh, CMD. They've been running, averaging close to their 95%. Uh, year to date, right now they're at 89%. Aspen Park Metro has installed an injection well and they're no longer using the, the uh, exfiltration galleries that gave them trouble in the last 15 years. And so now they are also up in the 80s at 84% year to date. A big, uh, well, very influential law that went into effect in 1972 is the Clean Water Act. That's uh, really uh, having to do with the whole environment. How are we going to protect the environment? Two years later, the uh, Drinking Water Act specifically focused on drinking water quality. And both of these laws require the EPA to establish what the contaminants are and what the maximum contaminant levels should be. Uh, at the state level, CDPHE, is the organization that issues permits for centralized systems to uh, uh, discharge water back into the groundwater. And it's the EPA limits that came out of this whole process that they use to monitor quality. Uh, two years ago, three years ago now, 2019, a cease and desist order uh, was issued to a Conifer Metro District because they were exceeding the 400 milligrams per liter limits uh, on TDS. And, and part of this uh, presentation tonight is to answer the question, why do we care about that? At the, C, at the max contaminant level, TDS is not a health hazard. Okay. If you look at the, the nationwide levels for TDS, you see a typical uh, tap water runs from about 170 up to 400 milligrams per liter. Nationwide, uh, EPA lists TDS limit as 500 milligrams per liter, but different regions and for different purposes have different levels. CMD's limit is 400. Up in the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul have a 250 milligram per liter limit. Uh, the TDS are the total dissolved solids, the ions that are in the water. They're contaminants. They're not the suspended solids. They're below two microns in size. And they come from uh, human activity, from waste, from uh, shampoos, cleaning agents, soaps. And they also come from the uh, CDOT uh, uh, friction materials that they use to give us uh, some traction out there. They're putting out mag chloride and sodium chloride. So 
We were wondering two years ago if it was just a CMD problem, so we started to look around. We have data now on both of the metro districts here. And the 400 milligram limit is the uh, milligram per liter is down near the red line. And the two trend lines are CMD and Aspen Park metric. Uh, the, the trend line for CMD is currently at 1,250 milligrams per liter, or three times the, the max contaminant level. And Aspen Park is at about 1,100, uh, but their volume is greater and their slope is greater. And the slope of these lines is what we're really concerned about. Two years ago, we started monitoring 14 points around the community for surface water levels, contaminant levels. Uh, we're looking at the headwaters. We sit high in the, the watershed here in Conifer, and we're looking at the headwaters of the two, uh, North, North Turkey and South Turkey Creek. And it's interesting to note, um, the Staples area uh, has effluent. The CSA effluent is piped down to CMD commingled with their effluent, processed, and then same number of gallons roughly are returned up to that Sinclair station right at Highway 73. And they're discharged to, to the uh, North Turkey Creek. Uh, if you look at this list over here, uh, the 1,769 milligrams per liter figure is close to their discharge point. So the conclusion we drew from that is that it's not just a CMD issue. It's community-wide, has a lot to do with uh, human activity. And uh, CMD has been trying to process a variance to take their limit from 400 up to 1,661 milligrams. And I guess the concern we have is that in 2012, 10 years ago, the chloride levels, chloride makes up um, 40% of the TDS. We're at averaging 186 milligrams per liter, and it's going up that same sloping line, and it's now averaging 421. They were given a variance. And so what we've proposed as a public comment was to limit a, a variance time-wise to five years and start a team to focus on uh, addressing the issue rather than uh, the, the very uh, rather than the uh, variance. Uh, so the TDS status uh, right now is that in about November December of this year, uh, the CDPHE group or division we, uh, has made a proposal uh, to the uh, Water Quality Commission. And they will decide, they'll put it on their agenda about November or through January timeframe, a monthly agenda as to whether or not to have a hearing. They have one, it's still a one or two months of review of all the public comment to go through yet. And so at the next uh, town hall, we may have a, a decision, but the uh, CDPHE is, is looking seriously at uh, at, at uh, taking a different approach, or at least look, taking seriously the comments. So I'll be around after uh, presentations tonight if you have any other questions. And uh, thank you. Thank you, John. So obviously wildfire and water, two big issues. How about Highway 285 traffic, especially on Friday night? Um, so obviously that is on a lot of people's lists as far as an issue that they're concerned about. And we have Brian Meyer and Jana Spiker with CDOT tonight um, to talk a little bit about the Kings Valley interchange and also some other areas. Here we go. Brian. Excellent. I'll start off by introducing myself. My name is Brian Meyer. I'm with the CDOT Region 1 West program. I'm an engineering project manager. And good evening, my name is Jana and I am a resident engineer. So I um, manage and supervise a group of our design um, engineers who oversee work here in Jefferson County. Um, so I'm gonna start off tonight by addressing 
um, something that didn't happen here in Jefferson County, but on 285 in Park County, on August 29th, there was the fatal or fatal um, semi-crash rollover there at the bottom of Crow Hill. So I did want to provide an update to this group. We did reach out to our CDOT Region 2 office who oversees uh, 285 in Park County, and they have recently canceled a project that they had on the books to remove the signal at County Road 43A, which frees up about $1.3 million of safety funding that they intend to use to construct some interim improvements down there at the bottom of that curve. So what they're looking at is potentially some concrete barrier there along the outside along the river, as well as some solutions to mitigate the median crossovers that are occurring. So with that, they are gonna begin design this fall and I will keep you guys updated as that project continues to uh, move forward. So I wanted to give you that update and I will turn it over to Brian for more updates in the Jefferson County area. Thank you. Good deal. So run through a couple projects here. We've got going on the 285 corridor. We've got the obvious one, that's 285 and Kings Valley Drive. We've got US 285 and Pine Junction signal improvements. And then we also have an upcoming resurfacing project that's going to extend from Pine Junction uh, to Foxton Road. We'll start off with the Kings Valley project. Good deal. So we've run through the background and history the last couple times we've been here, so we'll skip. Thank you. We ran through the history and background the last couple of times that we've been here, so we'll skip the majority of that. But we started designing, designing this project based on the 2004 environmental assessment completed, or 2004 environmental assessment. Started designing that in 2015, and we discovered this historic property. This historic property required us to go through um, what's called a 4F process, where you need to look at alternatives for um, ways to not impact that property. Um, and so out of that alternatives analysis came this alternative, and this is pretty rough, pretty preliminary, um, but this is looking south. 285 is running right, and that's if you want to head to Bailey, and to the left is heading towards Denver. Um, so benefit of this is that it shrinks up our footprint, so we impact the properties to the south, south less. Um, it's raising up 285, so it'll ease uh, both that. It'll, it'll make driving it a lot more comfortable rather than the steep grades coming down. Um, that's kind of the general idea here. Uh, with that, this project's quite a bit more expensive than the previous version in 2015. This one, a rough estimate, is about $40 million. The previous one was about $15 million. But good news, we're underway with design with this new alternative. Um, we're expecting this to take about 18 months to go through the full design and get all of our clearances squared away. Um, the one thing that we're missing is funding, which we're act actively seeking for opportunities to, to get funding for this project. Uh, but also being able to actually go through and design this allows us to get uh, good quantities and an understanding of what this thing's actually gonna cost. Um, I'm not gonna read all this on the screen. Big takeaway is that this project is listed on CDOT's 10-year plan. Uh, we have, it's listed under 285 corridor improvements near Pine Junction, and it's slated for $60 million. But this line item also includes widening for US 285 and then also auxiliary lanes or um, at Richmond Hill and Shaver's Crossing. And that's this place does the same thing. Uh, so in the coming months, there's going to be more updates on what this project's looking like, what it's going to cost, things of that nature. Um, so I've got the project website up here nice and big if you guys want to take a photo of it or whatever so you can keep up to date on the project. And two other projects we're going to run through is 285 at Pine Junction, the signal here. Um, there's a project in place to replace the signal equipment. 
we're going to rebuild some of the pork chop islands and upgrade the detection system to be a, a radar system. Uh, this project doesn't have construction funding identified at this time, but it could go as early as 2024 or 2025. Uh, it could also get looped into this resurfacing project spanning from Pine Junction to Foxton Road. Uh, the main idea is you're getting a nice new asphalt surface. Uh, we're, with that, there's guardrail improvements, bringing those up to standard. Um, new signage so it's nice and reflective so you can see the signs and that sort of thing. And so this project does have identified funding. It'll be about uh, year 2025. Uh, cool. And then lastly, it's like Jana and I get into the, the details on this project for not the ones who ultimately say um, go or no go decisions on funding or which projects are prioritized. So I put two of our contacts up here from our Transportation Commission. That would be good to reach out to if you want to uh, just voice your preference for some of these projects to be constructed. That's all I've got. Thank you, Brian and Jana. So um, obviously, um, 285, though, is an issue sometimes. And partly because of that, Conifer Area Council actually formed a Conifer Loop roadway project a few years ago now, several years ago. Um, and um, so I'm going to actually give a little bit of an update to you regarding that. We've been working with Jeffco Planning and Zoning for several years on this project. So the Conifer Loop Access Plan, now on page 28 of the existing Conifer 285 Corridor Area Plan, will be a recommendation for all new development in the Conifer Village Center. The Conifer Loop Roadway began as an extension of Main Street in the 1987 and then the 2003 Conifer Area Community Plans. Over time, due to meetings of the study action team and input from community members on our surveys, community members believe that Main Street is just one part of a desired roadway loop through the Conifer Village Center. This loop would offer people the option of traveling to existing businesses, services, neighborhoods, sorry, <laughs> churches, schools, and parks without having to get onto Highway 285. It would be a two-lane, two-way service road that would also offer safer alternative transportation options such as pedestrian and bicycle paths. Since the loop roadway will be an extension of existing infrastructure, the final configuration will have variations and will likely take several years to complete. According to residents in past surveys, development along the loop roadway should consider creating community gathering spaces, such as outdoor plazas, restaurants with outdoor patios, community gardens, outdoor amphitheaters, playgrounds, botanic gardens, skateboard parks, and other similar uses. These spaces should have both um, sod and natural areas and provide the opportunity for both active and passive recreation. So, um, it, this has been in the Conifer Community Plan for some time. It's still there, and there will be recommendations to do this Conifer Loop as time progresses. There will be more questions about the Conifer Loop Roadway and other issues we're talking about tonight in our new 2022 survey to be launched in October. So we want your voice to be heard, so be watching for that survey. Okay, so the next issue that um, seems to be very, very important to Conifer-ites is maintaining our small rural town character. In fact, that's number two. Wildfire is number one. Maintaining our small rural character is number two. And three is water resources. So, um, according to our, uh, and that's according to our surveys. Supporting our small businesses and filling up those empty storefronts not building more, has been very important to us. I'd like to introduce our new Conifer Area Chamber Director, Tam Masoner, who is working hard to support our small businesses. Tam. Hello, everybody. First and foremost, I would like to thank you for letting me speak at your meeting. Um, 
I have been in my role as the executive director of the Conifer Area Chamber of Commerce for two months now. Um, learned a lot in those two months. Um, I look forward to the future and growing the chamber. Um, we do have six new members in those two months, which that's really a great number for us. Um, so I look forward to getting more. Um, the, um, I do welcome you any, you know, it's, it doesn't have to be just small business. Um, our top tier membership um, level, we just got two of those. And so um, it can be a bigger business, you know, as long as they support the Conifer Area Chamber of Commerce and the businesses that we have up here. So that's the whole point. Um, membership information is on our website and we do have six membership tiers um, at goconifer.com. And you can call me with any questions. My business cards are right back there. You can grab one, send me an email, um, call me, give me a call. Um, please let me know um, how the chamber can help you grow your business. Um, we do have two events this week. The flyer looks like this. And it's a mixer, and it's um, a, it's called Fall in Love, and it's an uh, after-hours mixer, and it's a Luna's Mandala, and the Mountain Glow Skin Care from six from I'm sorry from five to seven at the shopping center just south of the Conifer Post Office, and the public is invited. You do have to register on the website, and we just have drinks and snacks, and you can shop and mingle and talk to board members, ambassadors, we're all there. Or not all of us, but most of us. Um, we try to make every meeting. Um, so please um, register and then um, we just try to help businesses connect, build networks, and that's the reason why we do the dual business mixers. So um, it's a great way to check out the chamber and consider joining and promoting your business. And then the other one we have, you do not have to register. And it looks like it looks like this. Um, we have our last highway community cleanup, and um, the it's at As we meet at Aspen Park RTD Park and Ride at 8 a.m. Please wear your boots and your gloves and dress for the weather. We had it scheduled for last Saturday, but the weather moved in and we canceled it and moved it to this Saturday. Welcome to the mountains. Um, <laughs> um, volunteers receive drink vouchers from Snowpack Tap, Tap Room and Brooks Tavern. And this event is sponsored by Keller Williams Foot, Foot, Foothills Realtor, Realty by Karen Heidman. So come and be a part of the Highway Cleanup Conifer Crew 2022. It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, there was a lady last time that actually found a Target gift card and um, Everybody was laughing at her. Oh, you're going to keep that? Just throw it away. Well, she took it home and had $50 on it. So you can, yeah. And then um, there's also the Conifer Resource Guide. It looks like this. And I have some of those up there. This is all the chamber members. And um, thank you for having me. And I'll be over there answering any questions that you have at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Tam, and welcome to the chamber. Okay, um, so we will not have a presentation tonight regarding the new um, housing and commercial developments that are planned and at the county for review, but you do have all the information in your packets of information. Um, there's phone numbers to call, and um, these are obviously, you know, of concern to many of you, um, but you can be involved in the outcome. So. Please take a look at your packets. So to better understand what community members believe is important in the Conifer area, Conifer Area Council has actually facilitated four comprehensive Conifer community surveys. We did surveys in 2006, 2010, 2014, and 2018. We're also, um, like I said, we'll have another one coming out in October this year, 2022. According to the 2006 survey, trails was the number one area to be improved in the Conifer area, according to respondents of the survey. So trails has been important in every survey since then. A trail study action team was formed in 2007, and Peter Barkman has a trails team update. Peter. Thank you, Shirley. 
Yeah, I just want to, Shirley already gave you a little background on where we came from. The, the 2006 survey indicated that there was keen community interest in having trails. We want, we want to have the opportunity to, to, to get around without getting on the highway and in our vehicles. And it's, it, this keeps coming up in, in surveys as we do them. So it's, it's very high, it's a very high priority for Conifer Area Council to follow through on this. So we've done a lot. Uh, we we go through cycles where we're very busy, and then we uh, fade back in the background a little bit. In 2009, we funded the Colorado Center for Community De Development to put together a, uh, a master plan that really took our general ideas and gave it some framework so we could start to look at this and see what we want to do with this. There was also a companion streetscape plan that went along with that, that kind of fits with some of what we're talking about. Like, how does how do the streets look? How do they all tie together? And how do our, our trails tie into that? These things have been in the background. You could say they're collecting dust, but they're really important to us. We never did get these adopted formally. And I'm having discussions with Heather Gutherless on whether we should take another look at these and get them in there so they become part of our community plan, so they're there on the shelf that when things come up that we can actually implement projects. Um, uh, meanwhile, our, our plans keep evolving. We, we recognize what's going on in the community. Things are changing. Uh, there are other ideas come up in developments. And like Shirley mentioned, there's the, uh, the, the, the conifer loop that, that might be part of our community to, to at least be able to drive around without getting on 285. So we're, we're constantly thinking about this and thinking, what, what do we want to do? So it's an evolving plan. Uh, but more importantly, we've actually gotten some uh, some work on the ground that's made some big big differences in what you see out there. The first one was the Sutton Road Trail. We call it a trail. It's really a modified sidewalk. We did this. It was completed in 2010. We recognized, hey, we got to get something done, get this trail pro program started. And this was clearly a safety issue. We had kids from West Jeff Elementary and Middle School if they weren't walking in the ditch, they had to go into the flow of traffic. And we thought this is one way to at least get something in there. And those of you who've been out there for the Christmas parade know how much we use it during elevation celebration. The sidewalk is a nice, flat, solid place to, to be. So this was a real uh, achievement for us. We we're really proud that we did this. And it was funded through the uh, Jefferson County Conservation Trust Fund. And we had a match. We, we, we contributed to that. The next one was uh, the Aspen Park-Meyer Parkway connection, which is an improvement to the uh, underpass between where King Supers is and Snyder, uh, Meyer Parkway and Snyder uh, Road on the other side. What this did is, is help connect the commercial area and the residences on the north side of 285 with everything on the south side. It provides a link from the north side over to the community entrance into Meyer Ranch. It's been used for the Elevation Celebration uh, Celebration run that, that we help with. And uh, it, it really has helped with the connectivity through there. This too is Conservation Trust Fund and, and Conifer Area Council match. And then uh, for 10 years, we've been participating, helping to organize the uh, elevation run. It's part of the LCEL activities. And this raises funds for the schools and for our, our trails program. It's probably our single source of funding directly into the, the trails program. We continue to do that, help out with that. Uh, but we're also involved, in, we're, we're engaged in what's going on uh, outside of our own little closed group. We've been watching what's going on with Jefferson County Open Space and their master plan, which they completed several years ago. We, we uh, contributed comments, worked with them uh, as they went through the process on that. Part of that is the implementation resources and conservation green prints, their companion documents with us, and it's, you have to mine through them to find out what's in there. 
but in the uh, implementation uh, resources, it lists some, some recommendations we have, which is to extend a regional trail that was shown to go from Evergreen to Conifer. We talked them into extending it down to Randall's Ranch, so it, it starts to link more of the parks, puts things together. And, and then the uh, green print, uh, they actually, the Jefferson County Open Space is committed to a link between Meyer Ranch and Flying J to be completed by 2025. This is gonna be great. This is really important to the community. And I, you know, I think the squeaky wheel gets the grease. I think they, we made so much noise, they, they put us in the priority for that. Uh, we also participated in the Jefferson County Bicycle Plan, which was just adopted by the Planning Commission earlier this year. We uh, contributed uh, comments and looked over their plan and brought that in. And uh, happily, we can say that tw 12 major projects listed in that plan are in our area. These are things like improvements to Pleasant Park Road and improvements to Deer Creek. Um, those are major projects that are actually, they go in wide and they, they put in shoulders and what have you. Uh, but they also have 13, their network alignments where they're going to go in and sign, uh, stripe, whatever that they think is going to help for bike paths. And, you know, a good example is, is Herdy Avenue. They've got that in there for signage and, and striping. So, you know, we, we feel pretty happy that they, they, they heard us, they put some of these in there. This, this will be, we'll be seeing some things happen on the bicycle plan. Uh, we've also been uh, engaged with Denver Mountain Parks. Uh, probably not many people are aware of this because they go, oh, Denver Mountain Parks, you know, who are they? Well, you know, the, uh, James Newton Park is, is Denver Mountain Parks and they're working on an outdoor adventures and alternative sports master plan and they're, they're trying to come up with a better way to utilize their mountain parks to give people in the city, especially those disadvantaged, the opportunity to come up and appreciate the outdoors. It's great. It's great to have this, but they also want to engage the community. So we've been in conversation with them on how uh, Newton Park might fit in with our ideas of the trail system. So we're actively involved with that and, and looking at those potential connections. Um, current focus for us, what we'd like to do is, is work on links, knowing what's going on with open space. We'd like to look at how you would link their link from Meyer to Flying J into more of the community. We're, we're working on that. We're working on how do we get Beaver Ranch connected to the community and do we use Newton Park on that um, and, and then look at how this whole regional uh, system is going to work and how we can become part of it. And the other thing we really, we're going to continue to be engaged with this, but I think we also want to look at this old 2009 master plan that's been collecting dust and and, and sit down and I'm, you know, I'm having conversations with Heather Guthrilis if we revise that knowing things that have come up like like the bike plan, open spaces plan, can we update that 2009 plan and, and get it adopted so it integrates, you know, we've got the uh, uh, transportation engineering department doing the bike plan. We've got open space doing this. They say they acknowledge each other, but are they really going to work together? I think it's up to us as a community to say, hey, you've got a bike trail here. Let's work on on how that would fit with our vision for a trail plan. So we're, we're gonna see if that old 2009 master plan is the way to get that in place and a, a document that we can work with. So that's all I've got and I'm, I'll be around. If you're interested in those other plans like Denver Mountain or the Mountain Parks or Jefferson County bike plan or open space, you can go to their websites and search and you'll find them. The, the Denver Mountain Parks They've pulled all the data out of there. I think it's because they're in the process of formulating the plan. I think we'll also put them on our website, as the links on our website, so you can go find them. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Oops. Okay.
<laughs> we might have a mic and we might not. There we go. It went off for a second. Sorry about that. Um, so another thing that's very important, according to our surveys, um, is to preserve historic places and buildings. A Midway House at Meyer Ranch study action team was formed to do just that. Katie Rothman is here to talk about that effort. Katie. Good evening. I am the team lead for the Meyer House. The one on the screen is our backdrop right there. And I'm going to give you an update on that project as we currently stand. A few years ago, the Conifer Area Council did a presentation at a town hall meeting regarding the Midway House at Meyer Ranch and possible opportunities. The yellow Queen Anne Midway House is an iconic beauty and a marker of history in our community. After working with the Conifer Area Chamber, the Conifer Historic Society, and Jefferson County Open Space, we are excited to announce that a historical walking trail uh, has been put on the open space green plan for the 2022 to 2023 build year. A lot of time and research has gone into planning with the first concepts uh, being explored back in 2018. A dedicated group of people are now planning paths around the property, looking into the history of ranching, homesteading, and aviation to be able to bring the community a new park with both state and local history. We hope to have the trail easily accessible and interactive with different kiosks. Our next goal is to create a gathering spot north of 285 and east of the Yellow House that will include a shelter, tables, bathroom facilities, information booth about local parks and trails, and beautiful outdoor space to meet up with friends and family. This space is slated to be built for the 2026 year. The community, we are all indebted to the entire Meyer family and their generosity and, and continuing assistance to making this all possible. We look forward to giving you an update at another town hall. And again, my name is Katie Rothman. I'll be in the back with any questions you might have at the end of our meeting. Thank you, Katie. Um, so Conifer residents have a long history of support for the Conifer Library and a desire for um, maybe a standalone library, according to our surveys. Marilyn Salzman will give an update by the Conifer Library Study Action Team. Marilyn. So continuing in the good news vein, Jefferson County Library Board has voted to budget $2.5 million in 2023 for a Conifer Library. And yes, applaud, please. <laughs> that budget will go to the county commissioners, and we are hoping the com commissioners will approve that budget in December. So I want to give you, sorry, I need reading glasses. I want to give you a little history. I'm not going to go back to the 1950s when the library board first talked about a library in Conifer, or to 1996 when uh, the library went into the high school when it opened. But in 2018, in our community survey, we found that most respondents wanted more access to library services. So in the winter of 2021, we conducted a follow-up survey. 560 community members responded, and 93.6% said they supported the idea of a library in its own facility. The complete survey and results can be found on our website, conifereareacouncil.org. In spring of 2021, we presented the survey results as well as historical information about, the about a Conifer library to the library executive team and asked them to fund a standalone library using existing infrastructure. Now, the, the county uh, library board does have a master plan that a consultant developed. In 2018, they said they would build one in Conifer. They suggested it be built between 2030 and 2032. Sounds like a long time from now. So we requested that that be moved up to 2025 to 2030. Uh, unfortunately, that didn't happen in the 2022 budget. So in the spring of 2022, uh, the facilities master plan was updated, and there was no timeline for the Conifer Library. Uh, the community again spoke up about our concern about a freestanding library and shared the survey results. In addition, uh, the library found out, and we found out, that Jeffco School District has announced that their start time for high school students would change to an hour later, starting with the 2023-2024 school year. 
This would mean a later library opening and cutting five hours a week of community access if the library remains in its current location. So as a result of that community input and the change of the hours, the library board heard us and they approved this $2.5 million for Conifer in 2023. Uh, what we heard is that the amount was based on the cost of leasing commercial property. However, I want to be clear that the library board said there's no decision at this point about whether the library will remain in the, in the high school or will be a freestanding library. The, the county um, library board will be having hearings and community meetings after the budget is approved and we will also invite them to the town hall meeting and I would like to introduce now Jennifer Redding from the Jeffco Public Library to talk a little bit more about next steps. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> As she said, I'm Jennifer Redding. I'm uh, one of the assistant directors of public services for Jefferson County Public Library, and I oversee the Mountain Libraries, uh, Columbine, and Belmar, and I'm happy to be here today. I have just a few updates of programs that are upcoming, um, and because we don't actually have the budget approved yet, I can't say anything about what's going to happen next, but as soon as we know next steps, you all will be certainly one of the first groups to know what's going to happen for sure. But I do want to just share that as you have probably learned, we've gone back to our regular school hours, which are Monday through Thursday from 3 to 8. And we are closed on Friday, Saturday and Sunday. We are open from 9 to 5. I will say that uh, the feedback from our summer hours uh, experiment of opening up for additional hours while the school was closed was very well received both by the community and, um, and by our staff because they are just happy to be providing library services to you all. And I do want to share just a couple of upcoming programs. Uh, we have a wonderful Raise a Reader program that's uh, down the hill at the, in Golden at the Colorado Railroad Museum. That's on Saturday, October 1st. Uh, it's free to register. We encourage you all, if you have little ones who are just learning how to read or, or, or just just pre-reading, we'd love to have you um, come down the hill and experience that fun program. Uh, we also are shifting our story times on Saturday. They were originally at 10.15 in the morning and we heard from the community that we, um, that we might get better attendance if it were a little bit later in the day. So we are going to pilot that starting in October uh, on Saturdays at 1 p.m. So that'll be on Saturdays. And I do want to share one new program that we're offering uh, at the Conifer Library. It is Craft Night. Uh, this is every other Wednesday beginning October 5th, I think is our next one. We've had a few so far. October 5th is from 5.30 to 7.30. So if, if you have some craft projects that you're in the process of um, working on, did I just lose the mic? I'm not sure. No, you still hear me? Okay. Um, nope, that went away. Did I kill it? I can also talk really loud since I am a librarian. I'm not a naturally quiet person. I am from New York, from the East Coast, so I have some yeah. friends here. Um, so yes, our craft night. If you have crafts that you're trying to get finished but you just can't seem to do it, come on down to the library and get that inspiration. Uh, I will be around after the program uh, to answer any additional questions. My business cards are available for you. I would like to continue to keep up the conversation about your desires for future library services in the Conifer area. So thank you so much. I don't know what it is. <laughs> uh, can you hear? Oh, I don't know. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm j I just have a loud voice, I guess. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, the next two speakers that are supposed to be speaking tonight, um, you know well, um, and they have been here a lot, because and, and they've listened to you, and they are doing so much um, to help with wildfire, water resources, all kinds of things. That is Senator Tammy Story and Representative Lisa Cutter. Unfortunately, neither one of them could be here tonight. Boy, sorry about this. 
Um, so they will not they will not be speaking, um, but that gives us a little bit of extra time. Thank goodness, because a lot of our speakers went over tonight, so um, we, we're doing good. So next we have Jefferson County Commissioner Leslie Dahlkamper um, to talk about um, the county and updates and many many things. <laughs> Thank you. Is that I, dead? That's yeah, okay. I think All it's right. dead. <laughs> Hi everyone, how are you tonight? Good. It's so good to see Peachy. Perfect. Peachy, Peaches. I'm Leslie Dalkin. I'm one of your three county commissioners. I serve on the board of county commissioners with Commissioners Kraft Barr and Kerr, and I have the honor of representing Conover on the board of county commissioners. It's so good to be here with you tonight. I want to detail a comment Shirley just made about Senator Story and Representative Cutter. Both of them serve on the Wildfire Matters Review Committee. This is a critical committee for the state legislature because it forwards. Okay, perfect. Can you hear me? Okay, perfect. Um, the Wildfire Matters Committee forwards legislation next session to the entire state legislature on issues that we care a lot about. Wildfire mitigation, uh, roads and evacuation, uh, building the capacity of our volunteer fire departments, and so much more. I wanted to share with you that not too long ago, four county commissioners from across the state, including me, addressed the Wildfire Matters Committee. One of the issues all four of us talked about is the importance of the state's help in addressing safe evacuation routes. We know that issue is top of mind for Conifer, for Evergreen, and for all of our high-risk areas here in Jefferson County. We're working hard with the state on that, looking at things possibly around the area of um, grants to help with mitigation. I was talking with one of our road and bridge guys, and he shared with me, you know, it costs $36,000 to survey trees for mitigation along one section of right of way. That's just surveying. That's just to identify which trees we're going to thin, let alone removing them. So we're, we're looking at state and local partnerships to tackle this issue and, and many others. The last time I was with you, we talked in depth about Jeffco's Wildfire Safe Program, and I wanted to share a couple of quick footnotes with you. One, uh, we heard Peter talk about the many plans that you've given input on. Thank you so much for that. And I have one more for you that I'm going to ask uh, you to share your feedback with us on. That's the upcoming Jefferson County Forest Plan. How many of you are on next door? Uh, then you may have seen a long thread that Steve shared with me. Steve, you might be somewhere in the audience a little bit earlier, about a petition that's circulating. There's some misinformation in that petition. That petition states that Jefferson County is going to mitigate 25,000 acres of open space. That is not true. It also states something I think along the lines or suggests that mitigation is, is not based on science. That is not true. We know when we thin our overgrown forests, forests burn slower, they burn a lower to the ground. It is a critical tool that we use to contain fires. So if you have any questions for me about that at all, please come and see me. Also, I would invite you to come and visit us either virtually or in person at an upcoming Board of County Commissioners meeting where we're going to be reviewing the Jefferson County Forest Plan. Let us know what your thoughts are. Let us know what you think about it and you can Again, join us virtually or in person that September 27th at 8 a.m. Just go to jeffco.us forward slash meetings and you'll see more details. One other really big note I wanted to share with you, and this is a huge shout out to our Foothills communities, including Conifer. As you know, the county doubled its slash collection efforts, and we restructured the program so that we're even more efficient and effective in terms of cost savings and reach. We've collected twice as much slash so far versus the entire year last year. We're really proud of it, and it's thanks to each of you. So you deserve a huge round of applause for your help on that front. Also, we just wanted to share, share some stats with you about Pine and Conifer. Any guess on how many loads we collected of slash to date from this area? Just a quick guess. I know Shirley gets a little concerned about audience participation, but I think this will be OK. Any guesses? Just throw out some numbers. 20,000, okay, it's a little lower, <laughs> but good. 
<laughs> Any other guesses? 33,528 loads to date. The program's not over yet either. That's terrific. 2,600 tons and 5.3 million pounds. Good job, Conifer and Pine. Thank you so much for all your work on that front. Um, also, we wanted to let you know that in July, county commissioners placed on the November ballot an initiative that would remove state grants and user fees from the Tabor formula. You've heard me talk about this when we talk about the county budget issues. And the Tabor um, Taxpayer Bill of Rights limits revenue that the county receives by applying a limit on property tax revenue and non-property tax revenue. This issue specifically impacts non-property tax revenue, including state grants and other kinds of fees, highway user fees and tax fund interest revenue and more. Right now, state grants count against our Tabor cap. And that's why a number of counties have removed grants from their local Tabor formula with the support of voters. So you'll see that issue on the ballot as well. If the measures approved this November by voters, again, these funding sources would not count against our Tabor cap. Some quick examples of grants that tip the county over our Tabor cap. I think one of these in particular you will especially care about, a couple of them, money for wildfire mitigation, mandated body-worn cameras for the sheriff's office, community corrections contract, many human services programs, as well as housing programs. So I just wanted to give you some examples of some, some real impacts that this cap has. And uh, just so you are well informed as you're determining whether this is an issue you want to vote for or vote against. Um, there's also been a lot of misinformation circulating about this ballot initiative, which will be 1A on your ballot. I want to be very clear. This initiative does not, we're going to talk about your Tabor refunds in just a moment, so hold on for that. It's going to be very exciting. Um, this does not affect your Tabor refund because your Tabor refund is only related to property tax revenues. Again, it only affects state grants and user fees, and I'm going to be here afterwards if you have more questions about this. Now, about those Tabor refunds, any guesses from our audience tonight about what, how much your check might be? coming in the mail in October. It was anywhere from four to seven dollars last year. Any guesses this year? Another four dollars? Forty. Well done. <laughs> well done. It'll be somewhere in the neighborhood of thirty to seventy dollars. And of course, how many of you have already received your state Tabor checks? All right, so this is your second check, and this is the one coming from the county. We, we get that question a lot, too, so just to clarify that as well. We're refunding this year the amount of dollars over our Tabor cap, and that amount is $17.3 million. $17.3 million. So those are refunds that you will be getting in the mail in the form of a check. Those are dollars that, unlike other counties that have debruised, we will not be able to reinvest in roads or public safety or other wildfire mitigation or other areas. But if you'd like to learn more, visit jeffco.us. And the other question I have for you tonight is how many of you know where to go if a culvert's backed up, if you see a big pothole in the road? How many of you know how to find road and bridge? Easy enough. Okay, I see a number of hands popping up. I know you do, Angela. I know you will find whoever you need to find when you need to find them. <laughs> But I want to tell you that uh, we have a new app. Jefferson County just began a new app called Your Jeffco. And if you see a pothole, if you see a washed out or flooded road, a downed tree, or any related issue, you can easily pull this app up on your phone and report it to Jeffco Road and Bridge. And just uh, a, a note for everyone, this app is uh, only for roads and unincorporated Jeffco, of course, that Jeffco Road and Bridge services. And then last but not least, more road and transportation news for you before we break. Um, I know I'm the only thing standing between you and the uh, candidates who are with us tonight. I wanted to share that last week we discovered a failing culvert at the County Road 73 and Pleasant Park Drive intersection just west of US 285. Road and Bridge is going to be putting out some cones and barriers while the repair is made. We intend to keep the intersection open during those repairs and we expect the work to be completed before winter weather sets in. 
There are some other updates, but again, happy to talk with you afterwards. I know I'm about out of time, and I just want to thank you so much for all of your input on so many plans we're working on in Jeffco. We appreciate your engagement. Thanks, everyone. Okay, thank you, Leslie, very much. Um, before I introduce the candidates, I would like to ask all of the Conifer Area Council board members and advisors to stand. We've got, there's three back there, four. We've got Katie up here, we've got Peter, Thomas, um, Duel. Anyway, um, it is truly amazing what a few very dedicated volunteers can accomplish. I'm going to start crying because they have accomplished so much and I am just so excited and so um, grateful to all of them for everything they've done. So thank you. So all candidates for um, county offices and state legislative offices or seats have been invited here tonight. Um, unfortunately, Ed Brady, Jeff Coe Sheriff candidate, and Matt Archuleta, Jeff Coe Coroner candidate, who had planned to be here, are not here tonight because of the investigation and funeral arrangements for Detective Vikoff. So um, we're sorry that we cannot have them here tonight. Um, but I would like to introduce all of you who are, and if you could please stand and, and wave. Um, Scott Kurzgaard for Jeff Co. Assessor. Scott. Where's Scott? Okay. <laughs> Is Scott out there? Okay. Well, maybe he'll be out there in a minute. Um, Amanda Gonzalez for Jeff Co. Clerk and Rick Carter. Back in the back here, Amanda. <laughs> and then Leslie Dow Camper, you all know she's here a lot. Leslie for Jefferson County Commissioner. And that's District 3. And also Don Rozier in the very back, um, also for Jeff Co. Commissioner District 3. Um, then we've got Annette Cannon for Jeff Co. Coroner. Annette back in the back. <laughs> um, we've got Patty DeLorenzo representing Ed Brady for Sheriff. Right there. Thank you. Um, Faye Griffin for Jeff Co. Treasurer. <laughs> Faye right here. <laughs> um, Regina Marinelli for Jeff Co. Sheriff. Back in the back. And then um, Tammy was going to be here, but is not. And then Mark Baisley for State Senate District 4, right here in the back. And Lisa was not able to make it. Then Adrian King um, is representing Eric Adland for, did I say that right? Odland. Odland. Okay, probably still didn't say it right. Okay, okay. For U.S. Congress for Congressional District 7. Okay, so these candidates will all be back out in the lobby and please go up, um, talk to them about the issues that are important to you. Make sure they're doing something about that. The ones that can, of course. You know, every, all of them can't. Um, and then I want to thank, um, again, My Mountain Town, Conifer for Jazzercise, and um, Tiffany and Christy with Remax Alliance. And... Um, most importantly, I want to thank you all for being here. And then please mark on your calendars, Wednesday evening, October 19th, will be um, a big wildfire symposium right here on Wednesday night. And then on Wednesday evening, November 16th, is our next town hall meeting. So again, thank you so much for coming. The candidates will be out in the lobby. Please go talk to them. Um, the presenters, the speakers will be in here, and so you can talk to them. There's a lot of wildfire mitigation information up there. So please stick around and We'll see you next time. Thank you.